I've been using the 67i for about two months now on the trail, and I can easily say that this is the best handheld GPS out there right now. But why am I not going to be using this, and is this the right GPS for you? My hunch is that the 67i is a Frankenstein device. This is a body of a 66i battery, everything the same on the form factor, but they swapped out the chipset, put in whatever the Phoenix 7 uses. Because if you look at the specs, they're exactly the same, but you get a longer battery life and you know, set of GPS capabilities, it's more like a Phoenix 7. So that's my hunch on what the 67 really is. And I'll talk about it a little bit more in a second. But before we get into battery life, what I wanna say is there are a lot of variables that affect how much battery life you're gonna get. Um, whether you have Bluetooth or Wi-Fi on, those are kind of minor. You can dumb down the multi-GNSS and multi-band to just GPS and get a little more but it's everything. It's like how often you're recording a track. It's how often you're zooming in and out on the map. If you're using it to uh, actively navigate you like on a route and it has to recalculate, if you have the screen on longer or shorter, if you have a not so clear line of sight to the sky and it's struggling to send messages over inReach, all of these things drastically affect the battery. So what I wanted to do is try to compare it to what Garmin claims. Uh, and I'm getting for basically the same thing. So 10 minutes uh, send intervals on in reach tracking, uh, multi GNSS and multi band on, recording an activity, out hiking. I'm getting around 140 hours on average. And that's with using it and looking at it once in a while as well. Not super heavy, but that's quite a respectable figure. And if you just make it GPS only, I'm um, getting upwards of 200 hours there. Uh, overall, there is plenty of battery life or longevity in this unit. Now, it also charges pretty quickly. It charges within an hour or two, depending on the type of charger you have, which also leads me to believe that it's a Phoenix because they charge pretty quickly as well. And, uh, you know, overall, it's a vast improvement from the 66 series, you know, four or five times the battery life. And what does that mean? In practical terms, I know a lot of us aren't gonna be out hiking for 140 hours straight, but if you are a through hiker, right? If you're doing something like the AT or PCT and you want to send a loved one 10 minute tracking intervals, you could use this for like two weeks and also have your GPX route loaded on there and waypoints for campsites or whatever. You could load all that on here and let your family know that you're okay and use it for around two weeks or so uh, before you have to recharge it. So that's a pretty powerful thing. And I think for the rest of us who maybe just go out on day hikes or shorter backpacking trips, having that extra battery, if you top this up before you go out, having that extra battery means you have more juice if you need it in an emergency, right? Let's just say something happens and now you're texting back and forth with, um, what is it called now? Garmin Rescue, it used to be Geos, used to be the IERCC, now Garmin Rescue, I think it is. Uh, but you're texting back and forth. Having that extra battery life will give you more time to text back and forth and just give you that peace of mind that your battery's not going to run out on here. So overall, the battery improvement is incredible, and uh, I love it. I think the positioning performance on the 67i is about as good as you're going to get short of a survey level piece of gear. I'm routinely getting six feet of accuracy on this with multi-band and multi-GNSS on. And probably more importantly, it's not just the accuracy, but it's the consistency. It's able to get a precise location using multi-band and multi-GNSS in challenging conditions like canyons or, you know, heavy canopy, whatever it might be. I never get the thing that I used to get where a hike was maybe 10 miles and it comes out like 11 miles because the GPS lost its, its way and now there's points all over the place. I never get that. If a hike is 10 miles with this or other multiband uh, receivers, you know, it'll come out to like 10.05 or something really, really close. So reliability, positioning, performance is great. Now I compared this to the 66SR, which I think has a different chipset, and also the Phoenix and Epix watches and also the 66S or 66i. And what's interesting is that the performance of the 67i and the 66sr and the watches are pretty much the same. There was no uh, point where one of them just lost its, its way and got crazy. They were all generally in the same place. If I zoomed down, it showed me on the trail. It was obvious that they were accurate. And what's really fascinating to me and uh, surprising is that if I'm getting the same kind of accuracy on a little watch like this that has a much smaller antenna than the quad helix uh, antenna of this, you know, why would I need a big thing like this if I can have it all on my wrist? So kind of interesting. I'll talk a little bit about that later. 
when you compare this to the 66i, uh, you know, the 66i is admirable and holds its own when it's not in a challenging uh, spot. But when you do get into those canyons or heavy tree cover, the 66i starts to struggle a little bit and lose some points around there. But the 66i, definitely not shabby, definitely works well. Uh, one thing to note, you can still tweak all of your recording, your GPX track recording settings on here, just like you could on the 66i and other GPS map units. So if you do use this and you want very precise tracks, you can do that. You can do waypoint averaging and all the kind of heavy duty uh, position recording things that you could do with other GPS map units. It's worth mentioning the things that did not change. And one of those is the form factor. It does have a USB-C connector in the back, which is obviously a welcome change, but otherwise, this is exactly the same case, the exact same weight, same dimensions. Everything is the same as the 66i. It dropped the little model number up top, but otherwise this is all the same. If you were a GPS map user of 10 years ago and you were cryogenically frozen and you woke up today and you looked at the 67i, the user interface would be very similar. I don't think they've changed this in years. There are some small tweaks. If you go to the bottom, there's a little plus sign now to add an icon to the main menu. You could always do this through the settings menu. I think it was home uh, and you can change the icons around. You can still do those things. But in general, the UI is the same with a couple little tweaks. If you go to the map page, there's a, a new option called map layers and you can turn satellite and topo maps on and off. You can load third party maps like OSM maps onto this. Uh, if you do, they do not show up in this map layers menu, but they do show up in the uh, old advanced menu setup, which is where they showed up before. So some little tweaks, but otherwise the user interface is still the same. Still no battery percentage when you're not plugged in. Uh, when you're using it, you need to use the Explore app or get a third party widget. There is a good widget. I'll put a link to that underneath the app, but otherwise UI is exactly the same. Using the Topo Active Maps is the same as before. You can uh, opt into Maps Plus subscription. I'm going to do a video on that and let you know whether that's worth it or not. So subscribe if you're interested in that. Uh, you can still download satellite imagery, even though Bird's Eye has been discontinued. You do need a Wi-Fi connection, but it is a menu option. Download Maps here and you can download them. That's a great thing. And those seem to be a little bit better than they were before that satellite imagery. Uh, still works with the Garmin Explore app, still navigates the same. I'm gonna update uh, my navigation video or how to. So if you wanna learn how to navigate with this, subscribe. I will have an updated one. There's some nuances with courses now that I just wanted to address. So we will do that in a future video. Um, it also works with the Garmin Messenger app and the Messenger app is what you use in order to set it up. And I just wanna throw out a big caution there. If you are up upgrading to this and you have an older unit, do not opt in to check-ins. I made a whole video on why you should not do that. I'll put it on the screen and under this uh, video right here on YouTube. So watch that video before you upgrade uh, because you might lose some functionality there, but otherwise all of that works the same. Same thing with InReach, all the same stuff. And InReach is sort of throttled by the Iridium network. It's not gonna be much different. The one thing that is a little bit better, marginally better, we're talking about maybe fractions of a second, is when you send an InReach message or request a weather report or anything outgoing on InReach, it needs to get your location first. So it gets a GPS fix. And now that you have multi-band and multi-GNSS, that GPS fix happens a little bit quicker. I noticed that my sends seem to be happening, you know, marginally quicker uh, than before. So that's a good thing. But otherwise, those things really haven't changed much. There are two changes that are worth mentioning. The first is that you can now wake the device by hitting any of these buttons and the screen will come on. It used to just be this top button. I think that's probably a welcome change, unless this is banging around in your pack and it, going off accidentally, but that happens now. And the other thing is definitely not a welcome change. They got rid of USB mass storage mode, and that allowed you to plug this in to a computer and have it look like a disk drive. You could copy files back and forth. Now the only option is MTP. They also got rid of NMEA, which is another protocol that's used in uh, the maritime world. That's gone as well. I know on Mac, some people were having trouble connecting and they were saying it doesn't connect to a Mac. Here's what you have to do. If you're running Garmin Express, you don't have to do anything different. Just put it on MTP, MTP mode and it'll sync correctly. If you want to get to the files directly, you have to download a program from Google called Android File Transfer. And that will let you see this as a disk drive. And if you can't get it to connect to Basecamp, this one took me a while to figure out. 
Uh, you can only have one MTP connection on at a time on Mac, maybe on Windows too, but you need to make sure that Garmin Express and Android file transfer are turned off and then it will work with Basecamp. And is your head spinning yet? Yes, mine is too. But anyway, if you're a big Basecamp user, you're gonna have to deal with that on this. But if you don't use Basecamp, you just use Explore, really nothing to worry about. All right, the million dollar question, should you get the 67i? I think if you just want the best thing that's out there, this is it in my opinion right now. If you have a 66i and you're thinking about upgrading, if the 66i works well for you and you're happy with it, you don't need to get this. If you are finding the GPX tracks on your um, 66i are lacking, especially in challenging environments and you want something better, this is definitely the move. If you just want some more battery life on your 66i, just go to Amazon and buy a USB charger for 20 bucks and call it a day. It'll solve that problem. If you have a 66SR and are wondering if you're going to get uh, more accurate uh, tracks, more reliable tracks, the answer is no. It'll probably be just about the same. But if you do want inReach, this is a good choice. And if you want a longer battery life, this is a good choice. If you have an inReach Explorer, one of those old ones, uh, if you should upgrade to this, if you're happy with that, I'd say no. This is definitely a more powerful tool for navigation because it has the routable maps on here, but otherwise the InReach Explorer has a really long battery life and I think uh, will work fine for you. No need to upgrade. You're wondering be, uh, whether you should get this or a Mini 2. People have asked me that already. This has navigation tools on it. The Mini 2 has limited navigation tools. There's no maps or anything. If you're a fair weather hiker and you hike with your phone for navigation or a wearable for navigation like an Epix or a Phoenix and you have the uh, you want in reach, just use your Phoenix and your Mini 2 and I think you'll be fine. Um, if you have a smartphone and somebody told you to get a handheld and you're thinking, why on earth would I get something like this? This looks like a Nokia phone from 1998. It is. It's basically it looks a lot like that. But a phone is not a rugged outdoor instrument. When you, uh, if you've hiked out in the rain and in the cold and everything, using the touchscreen can be a nightmare, especially if the tap targets are small. You have to deal with offline maps. Navigation's not built into a phone's uh, operating system. This type of thing is you can drop this, you can use it in the rain. The buttons are all have tactile feedback. You can move them around. I've been in the situation where the conditions are really bad or when I'm really tired and having the buttons and having a really simple UI is definitely much easier than using the phone. So I'd say get this only if you're hiking in extreme conditions. If you're just a fair weather hiker, I think having a, um, having a smartphone and an inReach or some other satellite communicator is the way to go. Uh, and that's that's what it is. And what am I going to be using? I mentioned in the beginning that I'm not going to be using this. I used one of these uh, for years to document trails. I create trail guides as part of this channel and what I do. And this is the best thing for documenting trails. But after having used this and my epics, I found that the epics uh, tracks are pretty much as same thing as the tracks on this. I set the epics to one uh, second recording, and I just pause it when I stop. And the fidelity of the tracks, and you know. The quality of the tracks, I guess, are basically the same as they are on this. So instead of carrying this kind of big clunky thing around, I'm going to bring my um, Epix and I'm going to bring an InReach Mini. And I have maps on my Epix. The Epix works in bad weather, all button operation. It can route me in case of an emergency. Uh, and I will use this with my Mini and, of course, a paper map. And the reality is, you know, I always talk about having a device like this is he helpful if you need to like route yourself on the fly, right? Let's say I have to bail out of a hike or go to a hospital. I can have this do it already for me. But the reality is whenever I have to bail out of a hike, I pick, you know, I look at my paper map. I see where I am on my GPS. I plot myself on the paper map and I just say, well, what trail should I take to get out of here? And that's how I do it. I don't rely on this routing me like a Google Maps type experience to get out. Um, and I certainly could, but I, I just don't for whatever reason. So I'm going to go with my Mini 2 and my Epix. I've got the Epix Pro um, large one, the X one. I'm going to do a review on this shortly as well. But that's what I'm going to use moving forward, and uh, I think it's going to work well. But maybe this is better for you. Either way, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the comments. And if you like the video, if you could give me a thumbs up, I appreciate it. This is entirely user supported. Please support the channel so that I can do independent reviews like this and uh, not have to take money from other companies to do things like this. And uh, yeah, guys, I appreciate you watching and I'll see you out on the trails.